So we now uh, call the, the Auckland Transport uh, team. Uh, welcome to the, uh, the various representatives there. Um, and just before I hand over to the chair of the, um, of the AT board, uh, Wayne Donnelly, I'd, I'd just like to, uh, to give an acknowledgement of uh, Mark Lambert. Uh, this is the, the last meeting that uh, Mark will be appearing before uh, this committee in his, uh, in his role as acting CEO of, of Auckland Transport. And uh, I think it's only fitting that I take this opportunity to publicly uh, thank and, and acknowledge Mark for his uh, quietly confident and assured leadership uh, in this position. Um, certainly as far as this committee's business goes, Mark has been an incredibly helpful and responsive to any sort of matters that has been brought to his attention. Um, his tenure uh, as acting CEO has coincided with a, a series of crises, really, um, uh, probably and challenges unparalleled in, in the history of uh, Auckland Transport and the, and the Auckland Council, uh, when you think about it. So in, in this respect, uh, when, I, when I think of Mark, I, I think of that catchphrase uh, originally appeared in World War II British posters of keep calm and, uh, and carry on, um, and Mark has been the epitome of that. And I would say that now more than ever, that kind of leadership is required. And um, Auckland Transport and Auckland Council have been most fortunate, in my view, to have had Mark at the helm during this time. So thank you again, Mark, and on behalf of this committee and, and indeed of Auckland. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Mr Chair, the, um, what, what we're going to do now is give you an update and then we'll move on to the other items as you, as you see it. In terms of, um, and that the contents are up there, I'll just move on to the next slide. It's just um, My job's just going to talk, talk you through the recent highlights, which probably are well known to everybody. As you say, quite an unprecedented uh, four to six weeks that we've all been through and it's um, we're, we're through emergency management and now we're, we're dealing with recovery and particularly particularly on, in, in the west of um, New Zealand but I, I, I know a lot of AT staff I'm sure the same as council staff a lot of people are still dealing with properties that were flooded and, and, and those kinds of myself included and um, it's, it's sort of I think back to anniversary weekend and on the Friday night we we're all focused on our, you know, the commentary on our much maligned plans to get people to and from the Elton John concert and, and were worried about the fact on the Saturday there'd be no trains at all. And boy, how quickly did our world change and all of a sudden um, the, Mark and his team had to pivot from Elton John to actually dealing with a record rainfall which unfortunately also took lives and just shows you how quickly nature can change, change our world, uh, world and where our priorities are. Um, and, and it, it, you know, we're not through this recovery yet and it's certainly going to have an impact on our coming year, isn't it? And, and um, certainly pledge Auckland Transport's um, support to do the best we can for Aucklanders through, um, through that. Uh, like, it's, we, there's, there's some really good news in the fact that public transport patronage is growing and Mark, Mark will show a pres uh, in, in his presentation that actually there's quite a surge now and it's picking up and really starting to pick up to high levels. Uh, March is always known as Mad March. This is, this is a time when you know, it's sort of, sort of everything that people want to do, Auckland comes together and creates a bit of chaos on the network till everyone sorts out what's the best way to travel, when to travel and those kinds of things. But I think market's settled down again reasonably quickly this time, hasn't it? Um, through all that, we have managed to complete the implementation of the phase three of, of our safe speed management program. And uh, we're, the first, the first tra couple of tranches have been in place for a while now, and we are seeing really encouraging results uh, from, on the, from a safety perspective when you compare roads that have had speed management applied and those who have where it hasn't. Um, there's been a decrease of uh, death and serious injury on the, the ones we have treated, while there's been an increase in death and serious injury on the rest of the network. So it does show that these interventions 
do have a role to play. Uh, it's been a very, very busy uh, summer in terms of um, uh, all, the, all the events that Aucklanders like to, to, to go to, and this has been a, you know, a very challenging time for those who, with an AT and our, and our suppliers, you know, who provide extra buses and, and train services and things to the, the, these events, and, and by and large they've gone, they've actually gone pretty well. And the, the other sort of highlight for the month is the appointment of a new chief executive, um, Dean Kimpton, which a lot of you people would know. And thank you, Mr. Chair, for acknowledging Mark in the way that um, you have. Uh, I would rate the CEO of Auckland Transport as one of the most complex and difficult public sector CEO roles uh, in New Zealand. Um, and generically, the interim CEO role is probably the hardest of all types of CEO roles because you, you get all the expectation, but probably only part of the mandate, which actually makes it an you know, even more difficult role to do. And as you said, in the nine months that Mark's been there, an awful lot has happened, really challenging stuff, um, you know, in terms of resetting our budgets, changing our approaches, uh, you know, out of the letter of expectation, then dealing with all the stuff that's happened in the, in the early summer. So uh, we'll, as a board, we'll have our chance to talk to Mark and, and acknowledge you know, what he's done. Uh, but it's, uh, it, it, I, I think it's actually been quite an extraordinary contribution to to Auckland is the way he's stuck to the task, and I'm sure um, the Lambert family would be quite keen to get a bit more back of him than <laughs> they've had uh, uh, over, uh, over the last recent months. So I do thank you for that acknowledgement. So I'll pass on to Mark now to take you through some of the detail of the, of the update. Thank you, Wayne, and again, thank you, Chair, for your words. Um, in two and a half weeks' time, I will be stepping back into my core role, which is integrating networks. So. I will definitely be supporting Dean um, in his um, new role as Chief Executive. Um, as we said earlier, uh, the previous um, agenda item covered our typical Q2 report. Um, so we take that as red, and this is really to give you, and don't worry, there's only about 10 slides, I think we'll try and go through them pretty quickly, um, a more up-to-date um, performance um, reports compared to looking back to Q2 last year. Um, Stacey van der Putten's joined us as well, and Stacey's our EGM of safety, and um, uh, we have got a couple of slides to talk about road safety and also safety of our frontline staff, um, particularly following the event um, at the weekend with the stabbing of a bus driver. Um, it's obviously a critical priority focus for us at the moment, so Stacey, um, I've asked Stacey to talk to that. Um, so firstly, very quickly, in terms of our um, performance metrics against our existing SOI, um, 32 metrics, um, uh, we are exceeding or met um, across 13 of them, and we are currently um, not quite meeting, and we are pretty close on some, against 13, and six are not reported yet, given that they're normally annual reported um, metrics at the end of the year. Um, just some highlights in terms of the exceeded and the mets. Um, we now have, particularly following the introduction of um, low emission buses um, on Tamaki Drive services, 75 low emission um, buses across um, the fleet. Um, we'll touch on it in more detail. And as Wayne's already mentioned, PT boardings um, is a target um, and is looking reasonably um, uh, healthy, um, particularly during March Madness. Road maintenance um, results standards, not necessarily the volume of work, the volume of road maintenance has unfortunately fallen behind program and um, given the, the bad weather and the refocus onto um, responding to storm events, but the results um, in terms of smooth um, travel on roads that have been maintained is above um, uh, our metrics and our responses to complaints um, are ahead of target as well. Um, in terms of targets which have not been met, unfortunately, as I said, um, death and serious injuries on our road network DSI um, is a serious area of concern um, and Stacey will talk a little bit more about that and rail boardings um, is falling below target um, primarily due to the extent of the um, Curie Rail network rebuild, um, which has been finalised that work has um, after the setting of this year's um, uh, targets. So I've mentioned um, public transport patronage. Um, this is literally uh, the position as of last week. 
Um, so for um, patronage has picked up since the start of this year. Um, January, first of all, saw a 44% increase over last year. Um, the forecast for this year, uh, this financial year through to the end of June, is 64 million um, boardings per annum. Um, that compares to the current um, statement of intent target of 59 million boardings per annum, which is still low relative to pre-COVID levels where we did achieve um, in March 2020, the 12 months prior to that, um, 104 million boardings. Um, however, as of last week, um, we have hit around 81% of that figure compared to pre-COVID. So we're around 80, 81% of the 104 million pre-COVID um, patronage uh, performance. Last week was literally the busiest week we've had since March 2020 on the public transport network. Again, reflecting um, that concept of March madness. Um, and the performance of the network last week, again, still not where we want it to be, um, but a, a big improvement um, compared to the previous weeks following the weather events, um, with 90% reliability for bus, 98% for train, and 94% for ferry. Um, we also continue to face challenges across the network with the bus driver shortage um, and the Kiwi Rail rebuild. I'd like to just um, spend a couple of minutes just um, perhaps over the next two slides pointing out a few insights. Um, first of all, on the left, the two graphs show um, Auckland's performance, which we've been tracking for a while against um, in uh, Auckland's performance in red, against Wellington, which is in blue, and um, Christchurch in green. So the top graph shows our recovery rate of bus patronage compared to pre-COVID levels. We, we were... Um, lagging about 15 to 20 percent behind um, Christchurch and Wellington uptake on public transport. We've now um, recovered certainly to Christchurch levels. We're still about at 10 percent behind Wellington utilisation, um, but it's pleasing to see that we've um, been able to recover that. So the recovery in Auckland of public transport use has been slower than in other centres in New Zealand, um, and we believe that's primarily down to the longer lockdowns that and we're in Auckland during the COVID period compared to other cities. The bottom graph on the left, um, again, uh, red is Auckland, green is Christchurch, and um, blue is Wellington, um, is our bus service reliability. Um, and it's obviously been fluctuating, but at this point in time, again, not quite where we want it to be, but it's certainly improved in Auckland, um, and it's overtaken Christchurch and um, Wellington. I'm not quite sure what the, the big blip there was for Wellington in blue, but... Um, we're certainly caught up to where Wellington was a few weeks ago. And the graph on the top right um, shows bus driver um, vacancy rates. And so as you can see over the last um, 34 weeks or so, um, we've basically had a, an increase in bus driver um, shortfall, and which peaked um, a few weeks ago at around 23, 24%. And we're now at 17% of the total workforce required to operate the full timetable. Um, and that's where we wanted to get, um, for starters, is to into the green space below. The green is less than 13% vacancy of the workforce, which through overtime and things like that would allow us to operate a full timetable. Um, so we're at 17% vacancy rate versus 13% um, to operate a full timetable. Um, some good news, uh, relatively speaking, and the bus driver shortfall of 363 is actually an improvement compared to um, December of about 150. So there's been quite an extensive recruitment um, over the last two months or so by operators. Um, and uh, I understand there's also 300 overseas candidates in the pipeline for our bus operators as well, which if all came through, big if, um, would, uh, would resolve the vast majority of the current shortfall. Um, another um, insight which, as I was preparing this presentation, um, I saw um, in the Australian Guardian on Monday, um, which published an article um, which effectively reported on Sydney and Melbourne public transport utilisation. Um, what it basically said was that um, in Sydney and Melbourne, um, they're, they're reporting an 80% um, recovery of public transport patronage um, compared to their maximum um, point pre-COVID, which actually is exactly the same as Auckland as of last week. Uh, we've been on a slow recovery, as we know, um, but if we're able to maintain that 80% utilisation of patronage compared to 
um, pre-COVID levels, um, we will be in line at least with other global trends around the world. Um, why, why aren't many cities at 100% of pre-COVID levels? Why hasn't public transport patronage um, recovered and responded um, to pre-COVID levels? Um, well, part of the answer is the work from home. Um, so the, um, the Australian Guardian reported that 20% of people um, are now working from home on average, and that equates effectively into 20% patronage um, reduction on public transport. Funnily enough, we haven't seen that in road use, um, um, but we, we are seeing that consistently now across main cities in the world around public transport. And on the right is um, uh, a survey we undertake of our PT users um, around customer satisfaction. We ask a couple of questions around um, their travel behaviour, um, particularly around work from home. As you can see, pre-COVID to um, December last year, um, I never work from home, which is the black has significantly decreased. Um, and the blue at the bottom and the yellow, I work from home two to three days a week, um, has quite significantly increased. And so our own um, users are saying that they're traveling less, certainly on public transport, and that equates to around 20 to 25 percent, um, which is the same as what was, has been reported um, um, in Australia as well. Um, in terms of our road network, um, how does that um, equate and how does that compare during the March Madness period? Um, so in the, the graph on the left um, shows um, what we call arterial road productivity across the arterial road network. Um, as you can see, the productivity on the network had been reducing, um, and that's the number of users on the road network over the last few years, which is not a surprise given COVID. Um, the key line there is the blue line, um, which is the 12-month rolling average. So in January um, this year, around our measure for arterial road network performance was around 30,000 people kilometer movements per hour on each arterial road. Um, and that's actually increased by only 1% um, over the last year um, since January 2022. Um, but as you can see, it's been fairly... Um, uh, up and down over the last few years, but we have the red line is our target, what we're trying to um, deliver or enable the arterial road network to perform against, and we've been progressively increasing our target um, through road network optimization to permit that. On the right hand side um, is our measures of the arterial road level of service, and the level of service effectively is the average speed of cars um, and, the, and congestion on the network. Again, the important line to note is the black line in the graph, which is the rolling 12-month average, where we can see that the level of service has, over the last few years, been progressively improving until the last couple of months where we've seen the start of um, increasing congestion, increasing busyness on the road network. I'll pass over to Stacey now, who will talk um, about some of our um, very serious safety concerns. Thank you, Mark. Uh, so for the 12 months to February 2023, there have been 643 deaths and serious injuries on all Auckland roads. So that is motorways as well as the local roads. And this compares to 600 DSI in the 12 months to February 22. So that's a 7.2% increase year on year. However, uh, road deaths are down 8%. So serious injuries are up and road deaths have come down. And approximately 20% of that DSI in the past year has been pedestrians and cyclists. So if we break that down further, that's 230 drivers, 128 motorcycles, 111 pass, uh, pedestrian, sorry, people on foot, uh, 111 passengers in vehicles, and 33 cyclists. Now, it's important to note that DSI comes from what we call the crash analysis system, the Waka Kotahi system. It only considers police attended uh, incidents in that. It doesn't consider other injuries across the network uh, that may have other, obviously hospital admission as well. 49% uh, of these uh, DSIs are actually in six local board areas. So they're Rodney, Franklin, Otara, Papatoi, Mangirewa, Mangakiki, and Tamaki. And Year to date, uh, eight people have lost their lives on our roads. Um, the reason why I use that graph here, uh, particularly to show you what we saw during COVID, in particular, 
Um, when we look at 2021 and when we went into that lockdown in 2021 mid-year, you can see the trajectory in terms of that baseline uh, that it's indexed to, it did sh shoot up. Uh, so currently we are under, obviously we were from that baseline, which is a good trend, albeit um, it does correlate to other things we see on the network too, which we're going to go to now. So similar to what we've seen on our roads during that period is also similar to what we've actually seen with what I would say is a sharp rise in violence, threats and aggression. Um, you will see on the left there we have our AT people safety events and our critical risks there. Uh, so 80% of the AT events when it comes to critical risk, uh, violence, threats and aggression against our people. Uh, predominantly in terms of our people that are across the network, so our transport officers, our parking officers, uh, those people in customer service centres. And it is, as you can see, it is up and down month to month, but it is quite high in terms of that. So when we look at on our public transport network, um, as you can see, August last year, it really spiked up in, in terms of that. So it's obviously a really concerning trend that we saw. So that started to really increase what I would say is probably about February last year in terms of that, the incremental increase with that, with peaking in August last year. And so from that, we did meet with supporting unions and a bus operator in order to look at what we could actually do. Now, a lot of that, that particular time was in the city centre. And so we deployed transport officers. We put in some static security at particular spots. Uh, and we instigated more Crime Stoppers initiative across our network, which we have now uh, used across a, a bus network, rather just the trial in the CBD initially. Uh, in terms of that, we also agreed to do a bus screen trial in August last year, and so we currently have those fitted on two buses. Now, we are sort of awaiting the full information and feedback from that, but as the initial information shows good support from bus drivers in terms of feeling safe, uh, but there are a number of ergonomic issues that we sort of have to work through in terms of glare and making sure they have good access to their side mirrors. Uh, so we're making sure we're sharing that information with our other operators and also the unions to get their support uh, because it is a change. So that's a bus driver screen that we need to consider in terms of that future view, what we do with our buses. I mean, ideally we'd have a side door as well. So we need to get sort of joint agreement on that in order to progress and understand what that looks like because obviously if we're to install bus screens on every bus, that is a retrofit program and there is a considerable cost to that that we have to work out as we go through. So it's, it's ongoing. You can see from there it has come down uh, in terms of what we saw at the peak in August last year, uh, but obviously they still would like to try and eradicate it. For, I guess, perspective on that in terms of what did it look like, particularly for bus drivers uh, pre-COVID, so in, this is actual physical assaults, 2018 we had seven, 2019 we had 10. Uh, they were mainly related in 2019 to cash box thefts. And 2020, we had six, 2021, we had seven, and then 2022, we raced up to 46 physical assaults against bus drivers. Now, between July and September that year, 22 occurrences, so it was a real um, startling sort of spike in that. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Stacey. Um, just a couple of more slides and just to give it a um, quick update on other areas of the business. So obviously for the last um, month or so, it's been very busy in terms of the um, weather event recovery. Um, as we reported last month, there's been over um, 1,300 slips across the transport network, the majority of which are now cleared. Um, we unfortunately have had to tow 6,000 um, flood damaged vehicles um, from off the network. 130 roads were initially fully closed. Um, 111 have been reopened. However, we've still got 19 which are blocked by um, slips. All communities have access either side to those slips. Um, and at the moment, um, we're undertaking geotech investigation or design work on all of those remaining roads to urgently open them as quickly as we can and to repair them. 
A number of roads um, are available, to, ready to be open, for example, in Pihau and Miriwai, um, but we're working with AEM on the timing around um, those openings. Uh, we've also been very actively engaged um, uh, in, uh, with local communities and with elected members, um, thank you Councillor Turner in particular, um, around West Auckland and working with the communities out there, um, which I think is, um, uh, we needed to get that out there very quickly in response to some um, concerns and um, it's been pleasing to see um, the appreciation from the communities um, uh, at times as well. Um, in very briefly, um, in terms of our capital programme, and I'll touch on our operating performance as well, um, our capital programme, uh, we have, to the end of January, um, we've expended £427 million, um, uh, which is around 91% of the year-to-date January budget. 56% of that has been funded by Council, um, with 44% um, being received from central government in one form or, or another. Um, recent highlights in the last um, couple of months include um, we've achieved a critical design milestone um, with the design of our new 23 electric trains, uh, which are currently being manufactured. Um, we secured 200 million of crown funding for the Eastern Busway um, project. Uh, we improved um, three high-risk intersections through our safety programme. Um, and as of December, we secured Waka Kotahi government funding um, for our significant ferry um, new vessel build investment, um, which I know we'll be talking about in one of the later agenda items. We're in the process at the moment of reforecasting next year's programme to prioritise um, working with council staff uh, around storm damage renewals, um, other renewals and asset management resilience, trying to focus um, in those areas and obviously um, also committed a critical path project such as the Eastern Busway and new trains, of which a significant part of our capital programme next year is already committed through existing contracts. In terms of our operating performance, um, slightly updated figures compared to the Q2 report. Um, so our operating performance year to date um, to the end of January um, shows a surplus of 14 million favourable um, again, uh, excluding depreciation. Uh, that's a four million unfavorable against revenue. And we're, pri we're primarily seeing a downturn or a, a, an underperformance against budget in our parking and enforcement fee area. Uh, however, bus revenue is signif significantly above target. And with regards to our expenditure and costs, uh, we're 17 million favorable. Um, and primarily that's been a focus through lower personnel costs, um, reduced track access charges from QRL as a result of not getting access to some of the track, um, reduced professional services and a reduction in PT contracts um, costs as well. And our final slide, um, looking forward to the next um, four to six weeks um, in terms of some of the highlights um, for us, obviously finalising our FY24 budget and draft SOI submission. Um, hopefully reopening some of those 19 um, roads fully and repairing some of those slips. Um, we have a sub turning um, uh, the first weekend of April, I believe, and for the next stage of the Eastern Busway project, which is between Pakaranga and Botany, including the Reeves Road flyover. Um, we will complete works um, on the Matakana Link Road, which is the roundabout that you see up there. And we are just working with Waka Kotai on the timing of the opening of the Matakana Link Road, which is linked to the Puhoi to Walkworth um, State Highway construction. Um, and as you heard from QRL earlier, um, as of this weekend, stage one of the QRL network rebuild will be complete and stage two will commence. And of course, um, supporting the transport single plan um, through the Mayor's Office as well. So thank you, Chair. I appreciate that's probably a lot of information, but I'm open to questions. Thank you, uh, Stacey, Mark and Wayne. And uh, in light of that last uh, visual there, very appropriate, Councillor Sayers, I think you lead off the questions and they're, they're really what I call roundabouts and certainly helping the flow of traffic on that road or, already, uh, Councillor Sayers. But away you go. Questions yeah. on the update? All right. Well, thank you for the segue, Chair. Um, look, Auckland, it's wonderful to have you along today. And, uh, um, I really appreciate all the work that's, that you're doing, your organisation, a stressful time for your staff and undoubtedly for yourselves, and wonderful to see the Chair here as well. Um, so my question is perhaps quite a broad question, a holistic question in terms of having you here, Wayne, and that's really around the 
And thank you for that financial update. So financial related question, and that's around the pressures that we are constantly seeing around this table that your organisations under in terms of funding requirements, particularly from Waka Kotahi and central government. And the question is around how, a if you agree with that, and b are there discussions happening at the board level around the model that exists in New Zealand set by a number of previous governments in terms of our current funding model and perhaps some of the inadequacies of that being able to deliver to you uh, compared to any other new funding mechanisms. Are they being discussed at a board level? And if they are uh, through you, Chair, um, how do we as an organisation uh, help you in advancing any ideas that your board may have? Well, um, th through you, Mr Chair, I, the board is discussing um, how we're funded at frequent intervals, I, I can assure, assure you, and um, I'd like to bring that back in a bit more detail to a, another meeting, perhaps, but, but the, there's, a few, there's a few things emerging. One is that... Um, the National Land Transport Fund is unlikely in the future to be funding major capital investments. It's, it'll probably cover renewals, and maintenance and operations or ongoing programs, but capital investment will, will probably be by Crown appropriation, which is quite a different process. And that, that, throws, that throws some question marks around RLTPs and those kind you know, regional land transport plans because that's all geared around planning and getting funding from the National Land Transport Fund. So that's, that, to me, is a really significant shift. Uh, of ongoing concern to the board is that the, the, through the National Land Transport Fund, there is a cap on renewals, which means we're pro we are not spending enough on maintaining our assets to the right standard. Because uh, if, we, if we go beyond the, the cap that's uh, that, that is currently being applied from the fund, then those renewals become 100% uh, council funded, which I don't think you're in a position to do at the, um, at the moment. Uh, the real pressures are actually in operations, um, so it's, it's it's operating funding rather than capital funding is really where the the the, the extreme pressures are, and if. If we're, you know, if we're looking to sort of rapidly improve public transport and things like that, large chunks of that comes down to operational expenditure. Uh, you know, and after CRL and Eastern Busway, there are, there is actually, there are actually not yet enough, a lot of major investments that put, of in, public transport infrastructure that are going to come pa come to pass in the next decade. So the your improvements are going to come from operations rather than investment and capital. So I think I'd flag, so I'd, I'd flag operations, I would flag uh, renewal funding, and I would flag that the national system of financing capital projects is changing, and we need to address that. Yeah. Well, through you, Chair. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Wayne, for, for that update. Uh, the, I think there was an invitation extended there that perhaps uh, the board could come back and present to us in more detail. Um, how do we uh, facilitate that through yeah, this committee? I, I think uh, Barry's picked that up and noted that, Councillor Sayers, so that will liaise with uh, the chair over that one. Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you. Th thank you. Okay. Uh, the, here's the, the lineup: Councillor Henderson, Dalton, Fully, Simpson, Bartley, Darby, Turner, and uh, Deputy Chair Chris Fletcher. Shane. Thanks, Chair. I'll try and cut my um, questions down, given that lineup. Um, so did I, or did I catch a comment that vehicle traffic had returned to pre-pandemic levels, but public transport hadn't? Yeah, I think we've, through the Chair, we've, um, we've seen that for probably the last six to 12 months, that um, road traffic has been um, recovering, if that's the right word, um, far quicker than public transport use. And there's a number of reasons for that. And it's, it's what we have seen in other cities as well. Um, it's the type of use, it's um, the travel demand. Um, also, people were initially quite worried about the re um, retaining face masks on public transport, which was a, in a perceived safety issue compared to not wearing face masks in other 
public spaces, which was an issue around 12 months ago. So there's very, various um, issues that have happened on public transport, which I think has just slowed the recovery down. Okay, so I, I'm confused as to how we can draw a causation line, as we kind of have in this presentation, between people working from home and not taking the buses when people are taking cars. So maybe people just feel that our public transport network isn't reliable enough. Is that the case? Well, I would agree it's not reliable enough, and that's what we've been working on, but it's, it's a constant... Um, uh, it, it, it's consistent across many cities in the world where public transport use has not had a similar uptake to um, car use, and that's in cities where public transport is extremely reliable. So I don't necessarily think it's a, a, a r correct rationale to compare the two. Um, I don't know what the complete answer is as to why public transport hasn't responded as quickly as cars, other than um, convenience, and it's... Um, easy to jump in a car, particularly for the longer journeys on state highways and things like that. Okay, um, I may speak on that point if we have time, Chair, but I've got a couple of other questions. Um, the graph on slide nine of this presentation for DSI data shows a five-year smooth trend line, um, but that line does include years where we were locked down for a significant amount of time, um, 2020 and 2021. Um, so I don't, it doesn't seem that there's any real evidence that DSI data is actually going down, uh, despite our Vision Zero uh, discussions. So what is Auckland Transport's plan to tackle this DSI problem? Um, just for clarity, which graph are you talking about? Yeah, top, top or bottom? Five-year rolling average. Yeah, that is a five-year yeah. rolling average. Yeah. Absolutely. And so the, the bars are actually where it's going. So you can see the, what we call the trend line in terms of that, that it is slightly changing and downwards. So that's including 2020, though. That, that was my question. Yep, yep. Yeah. absolutely it is. So yeah. in terms of that, have we made a marginal difference? Not where we want to be, obviously, yeah. And that's why I did put that other graph in there so you can actually see in terms of what happened through that period. Uh, and I guess we saw that uh, across the whole in terms of um, increased risk-taking and different behaviours through that period that did materialise on our roads. OK, so just one last question. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm going through the AT website and looking up the policy directives for Vision Zero and noting uh, that, that this policy work appears to have been fairly far out of date, um, talking about 2019 and 2020. Um, what... Why haven't we done any policy work on, on addressing this problem and do we plan to update these policies Absolutely. to have more of a Vision Zero approach? Absolutely, we do. So that, that's a good question. Thank you. So we're actually currently reviewing the performance business case for road safety uh, to make sure that it's actually looking at the right things uh, and that we're focusing, focusing our attention. And, and of course, in terms of those measurements as well. So. Obviously, some of the lead and lag measures, obviously DSI is a lag measure, right? And so trying to look at other things in terms of that as well. So it is being refreshed. We are trying to take a new look at it uh, and to make sure that we use the data that we have available in order to be able to make the decisions based on that. Like I briefly touched on, it is only CAS data that accounts for DSI. So when we did... Uh, a, bit, a study in terms of people outside the vehicle as an example and we used Ministry of Health data across the Auckland Regional District Health Boards in terms of hospital admissions it showed a considerable more uh, what I would call injuries across our roads. Thank you. Thanks. Councillor Dalton. Thank you Chair. Um, my question to Stacey was around the DSI so specifically the vulnerable users who does fall into a vulnerable user category? When we talk of um, vulnerable road users, we usually talk about people outside of the vehicle, so in terms of motorcycles, cycles and pedestrians. Thank you. So I'm wondering if there have been any projects that have been delayed or are currently delayed that have not helped to reduce the DSI for the vulnerable users? I, I think that's fair. Uh, in terms of has there been projects, I mean, it's about, you know, obviously prioritisation and funding and, and where we put our energy, which is why we need to take a fresh look at it uh, to make sure that we're taking all those things into account. Okay, thank you. Councillor Foley. Kia ora, thank you, Chair, and thank you for the presentation. Uh, my questions are around the safety issues and the violence and aggression. It's, it's really quite distressing to hear that big jump 
um, and violence and aggression um, that staff have been facing recently. Um, I wonder if you could just elaborate a little bit more on um, you know, what you've heard from the, the staff themselves, what feedback you've gotten from them, but also what's being done to support them through that. And I'm particularly you know, distressed about the stabbings that have happened recently, just this year, um, and what's being done to support those people through that. And also in terms of training and cameras and things like that, and do we have those sorts of things in place to protect our staff? Kia ora. Thank you. Thank you. So as a standard, we do have de-escalation training. Uh, de-escalation training and, and sort of process is the key to, uh, one of the most key determinants in terms of how something will escalate or not. Uh, so we do constantly look at those and refresh those. We work with the NZ Police. Uh, we have our own trainers as well in terms of that, but that is something that we continually uh, iterate and make sure it's relevant. So when we saw that spike last year, we still had face coverings on board public transport. Now that did inhibit communication for our people. And so that's one of the things we did was look at that de-escalation training to consider face coverings and how to communicate better. Uh, and also in terms of what was seen in the CBD, particularly uh, with ankle bracelets and the like. So making sure that was actually considered in that training mechanism as well. Uh, in terms of all our buses are equipped with CCTV. Uh, they do have uh, buttons which go straight to the depot that also records sound, so they have somebody right there online who can obviously dispatch help. Uh, and, and in terms of uh, people across the network when it comes to our transport officers who are obviously sometimes at the pointy end of confrontations, uh, they are equipped and work with body cameras as well. Yeah. Thank you. Councillor Bartley. Oh, thank you. I have a few questions. Um, I just wanted to ask about your report, um, where you say 91% are satisfied with public transport. Um, I just really uh, want to question that because, um, you know, we don't see it on the ground, and especially online. Uh, people have so many complaints about their public transport experience, um, which are, you know, justified. Sometimes a bus doesn't turn up. Uh, and even, yeah, so I'll, I'll get to the other question, but your uh, comments, please. Um, well, f first of all, that's a survey which has been undertaken for many years. Um, it's a Waka Kotari required survey as part of our contracts, um, so that's why we report on that. We also have a, another survey which, is, um, uh, which has a different scale. So it comes to a scaling of these surveys. So when you say 91%, it's, I assume, but I'd need to check, it's 91% out of a scale of 1 to 9 and the top 7 to 9, I would assume. Whereas on another survey we do, which is PT users in real time, um, it's coming down at around 70%, which is probably more reflective of what you're suggesting. So it's the survey methodology. I know that sounds like an excuse, but that's what it is. And we do a number of surveys, different methodologies, to try and get a broader picture um, of actual satisfaction out there. Oh, yeah, I think it'd be good to report on you know, those numbers. These seem quite um, uh, high. And in terms of the 96% punctuality, does that take it to account the buses that actually arrive and go? Because we've had so many cancellations, I don't understand how you can get such a high figure of 96%. Um, so in terms of cancellations, that, that will be reflected in the reliability figure. So reliability is a measure of whether a service actually runs or not. Um, and then the punctuality is a measure of how on time the services that did run were on time. Oh, yeah. yeah. So do you measure the services that didn't arrive? Uh, if they started and they didn't arrive, yes. Right. And then in terms of your boardings, is that, um, because we've changed the system now where there's a lot of transferring, are you counting all the transfers? Um, yes, so that's why we quote boardings, so it's the number of boardings as opposed to the number of journeys. Is that a realistic picture though, because uh, you've changed the system where you have to have more boardings? Um, well, it would have been reflected in the system around 2016-17 when we actually changed the bus network. 
So in terms of comparing over the last few years, yes, it would be. It would be like for like. Mm, okay. All right. Thank you. And then I also wanted to ask about the, um, the, the DSIs and what else we can do, in particular um, for the vulnerable users. And I know the response came back that it correlates with uh, rise in violence, but I don't think that's... Um, you know, we need to do more. So what else more are we doing? One of the reasons given was inappropriate speeds. Uh, so what are we doing more around lowering speeds that we could be reprioritising? Currently the team have been going around all local boards talking about the, the future of the speed management plan. Uh, so I understand we are actually coming back here next month to discuss that. Uh, there'll be a big focus within that in terms of around schools uh, and also in terms of particular areas that local boards have requested us to focus on. Yeah. Thank you. And one more question, please, Mr Chair. Um, capital investment will likely need to be reprioritised to respond to unprecedented events. Um, who's going to make the decision about what gets reprioritised? Um, obviously, we will be putting a recommendation up to our board, um, and that will be part of the budget proposal, which will come back to council for next year. And one more thing. Do you think the 1.7 kilometres of footpaths, new footpaths, probably contributed to why we have so many issues with pedestrians getting injured? And is that a good enough number? Um, it's not a good enough number. But it reflects the level of funding um, which has been signed off within our capital programme, and we'd like to increase it if we could. Yeah, Councillor, I'd just like um, you to know that the, the AT board has asked exactly the same questions around uh, reliability, punctuality, because it's not really giving us a clear picture of what's happening in real time. It's just a, it's the way reporting's happened historically. It's the way Wahukatahi measures how we're doing. But, it, it, but in terms of managing in real time and you know, and addressing the, the same issues that, that the public is saying, they're, they're, not particularly, um, they're not particularly good daylighting measures. So we agree with you there. Thanks for bringing that good point up, Councillor Bartley. Um, so we've got Councillors Darby, Turner, Fletcher and Ferry. Thanks, Chair. Um, three areas for questions, um, Mark, Wayne and uh, Stacey. Um, look, I note the recovery <clears throat> um, is, is quite strong, particularly in recent weeks, and, um, and I see that, you know, ferries particularly are 105 per cent, I think, weekends, that's weekdays, 120, 130 per cent on weekends. Um, and buses is, is very good as well. We know the reason for well. But um, they are on the, the, they are on where we should be three years ago as opposed to where we should be today. Is there a point where Auckland Transport is going to say we need to not be talking about pre-COVID, we need to be talking about where we need to be today and and resetting that that, that you know that data that all that information that's coming through and talk about today rather than th three years ago that's my first question I'll chair I'll just give them all and then and then we'll come back um, just in terms of the remote working mark you highlighted that Australian article in the Guardian and I've, I've read that in full too it, it's a very different picture to our city in some ways, but they talk, you know, about the the hybrid work, the the absolute full time remote. Um, but of course, cities are not uniform. Um, public transport patronage is not uniform. But we tend to talk about just a high level number, rather than what's happening. Say, maybe. You know, on the North Shore, where there's more professional work, more admin work, more managerial, and you can uh, be away from the workplace, as opposed to maybe South or West Auckland, where there is more construction, uh, a more assembly, etc. So, what are you noticing about the differences in Auckland and how we need to support the communities which are are taking the bus or the or the or the ferry or whatever it is in terms of public transport in greater numbers. So can you just give us um, an idea of what we're doing there? And the third question, Chair, is 
I see some, some of the bus companies and the ferry companies have a full complement of staff. They have had a full complement for some time and that there are some companies, in one in particular in the ferry market and a, a couple in the, at least in the bus market, who don't have full complements. So what are you noticing is the difference? Why are, why are some bus companies uh, having no trouble retaining and attracting staff, same for ferries, and why are others having the problem that we seem to be having to resolve? Thanks. Three questions here. Uh, th thank you, through the chair. <laughs> Um, okay, resetting the patronage figures, I um, completely agree with you. We need to do that um, as opposed to keep referring to the past. Um, but it's also important for us to understand where we are coming from as well. Um, and I don't have a, a simple answer for you, um, but I will take it back. And that what I think we should be looking at is on the back of the next RPTP, because that's where we will be specifying. And we've been, had some workshops with um, the councillors already on this. That's where we'll be spe specifying future services, future investment and everything else. And we, I th think off the top of my head, we should use that as the baselining or resetting of the baseline. Um, in terms of different demands um, across Auckland for, for bus services, going back to that article, work from home, um, we do know that historically, and this is another challenge for us, um, the public transport system has been very CBD centric. Um, it's primarily commuter focused, it has been. We have seen a shift, um, which is why we have just completed our first network recast where we focus more services and more resource bus services um, in the off-peak periods as opposed to the peak periods. So we've tried to put the resource where it's needed. Um, I don't have off the top of my head geographical examples of what's recovered more, but we, we do have it and we can provide it. Um, but absolutely take on point um, that North Shore may be more um, white collar versus other blue collar areas across the city. And that becomes an equity issue as well as we know. Um, when we are um, considering redesign of the bus network or where we need to put more resources, then I think it's fair to say that we need to look at that equity issue moving forward. And again, um, the starting point for that will be the, RP, the next draft of the RPTP. Um, in terms of some bus companies doing better than others, um, or ferry operators, uh, I think that's a very complicated question, uh, which I'm sure you'll know the answer to part of it. But all, what I will say, though, is we've seen, for example, in the bus sector, how can Eastern have done extremely well. They've had a, um, a, a full complement for quite a while. And it does come down to where the routes are operating as well and the geographical areas that uh, different operators are serving, which has an impact on um, recruitment into the industry as well. So that's probably off the top of my head. Yeah. Right, thank you. Thanks, uh, Mark, for those answers. Uh, Councillor Turner. Thank you. Mine's just about getting <coughs> bang for our open transport buck. Um, we all know that all the small things add up, all the small road controls, traffic controls have added up to being 25% of Auckland Transport's budget. The slips we've seen on the screen and stuff in the rural and outer areas, especially in the Waitakere's, the under road slips just disappear down the valley where there's no people on their left there. The over road slips charge over the top of the road and go down the valley. In Kerry Kerry, we bulldoze the stuff that was left on the road over with it. Everywhere else, we've been trucking it away. On Watapu Road, we trucked it all the way to the other side of Waimauku, over a 100k round trip per truckload, 10 days, around about 14 trucks on one day in total, I pictured, carting that dirt that could have just followed the, the, the overburden that had already gone down there. Why are we doing this and how can we um, save the money? Yeah, I mean, I don't know the specifics around what you've quoted, but what I, I do know is that um, what I can, all of our contractors do is assess whether potentially um, uh, dirt is uh, what, what, um, uh, needs to go to certain landfills, and um, depending on contam contamination and things like that. That might not be the case in the area that you're um, referring to, but I do know that that assessment is done each time, um, but I'm happy to come back to you on that specific example. That might be a reason that it may not in that case. I'd really like to have a talk to you about it. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Fletcher. 
Oh, thank you. And Mark, may I also add my congratulations to you and, and gratitude for what has been a remarkably um, capable and steady leadership during a tumultuous time. So thank you for that. On your um, weather event recovery slide, you highlight the 6,000 flood damage cars that were towed. Do you, is there a policy? You know, it, it was an unusual situation and presumably these cars remain the property of the insurance companies. But how are they, how are they processed? I might, I, I, I might cars. need to come back to you on specific detail, um, but certainly um, through our website we've been providing um, contact details for all owners um, to get in contact with us, but like you say, a lot of it is insurance, and um, companies now take ownership of that, um, but certainly we are, we've, obviously we've tracked where those cars have gone, where, where the pounds have gone, what pounds they've gone to and things like that, so we have all the details for when customers do contact us, and many customers have been contacting us. Yeah, no, it's just website. interesting to yeah. know in terms of disposals and making sure that cars don't end up back on the roads that are not roadworthy. Yeah, that, that's obviously not AT's responsibility. We, we basically take it to a, a, a compound, um, and then it's the responsibility of the insurance and that pound to actually deal with whether or not the car can ever go back onto the road. That's not our responsibility. Mark, the other question that I had to you, and it's not something that you've highlighted, but I note that you were present when we had up a presentation from Kiwi Rail. Is there any further insight you can give us on the work that you've been leading on grade separation? Um, I could probably give you a quick update on where we're at. So um, there's, a, there's a key um, road crossing that needs to be uh, removed for day one CRL. Um, there's a number of pedestrian crossings which we're already undertaking. So we're pretty confident in terms of where we're at for day one CRL operations. Um, what primarily Kiwi Rail were talking about on the Western Line in particular is post day one. So the benefits that CRL will be able to realise within, and we're talking about a five to ten year period after CRL, depending on patronage uptake, um, will depend on some of, those, some of those closures and grade separations. And we're currently, I think, um, uh, it was referred to, um, we're currently leading a business case for funding around that, um, particularly through central government. But it's, um, it's work which is not critical right now, but we do need to crack on and get that funding confirmed um, for the number of grade separations post CRL day one. I would really appreciate in um, future updates, you know, that's from AT, if, if we could have the inclusion on that. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. finally, uh, Councillor Fury. Thank you. Um, just wanted to uh, totoko the questions already asked about the deaths and serious injuries, so I won't revisit that, um, particularly around vulnerable users. But what I wanted to explore was this this difficulty we have here, where Auckland Transport slash Auckland Council is kind of seen as the employer of the bus drivers, but we're actually not. The, the bus companies are, and this speaks to both the safety piece and the recruitment and retention piece that um, Councillor Darby ably raised. So, you know, wanting to understand, um, you know, the, the question was asked, are some doing better than others? You pointed to one that is doing better. Um, you didn't say the ones that aren't. Um, but I would note that, you know, we must have stats on that. Uh, and it would be really helpful to understand what the contractual relationship there is and what levers AT has that it can, pulls, can pull both in the safety space and in the um, recruitment and retention space. And I think there's an interaction there where you know, one of the reasons we can't retain staff is because they feel endangered doing the job. Um, so what, what, how does that work? Because we can talk about we're putting screens in Actually, we're asking the bus companies to put screens in. They are the employer. So how does this work in terms of our PCBU obligations or theirs? What's the interaction there, please? Thank you. I'll cover this one. Uh, so in terms, you're right, they do have the primary duty of care in, in terms of the driver, albeit as a PCBU, and obviously one that's hand in glove in the relationship they do wear a uniform. Uh, we, we need to specify appropriately. So in terms of retrofitting, the, the, the buses themselves are the operator's assets. 
Now, the trial that we have currently underway has been funded by the bus operator in, in this instance. Uh, so, you know, going forth, when we do get to talk about a proper retrofit program, that'll be obviously conversations with the operators in agreement then. Uh, in terms of future specification, we have the opportunity to change that, uh, which is what we need to do. So in terms of bus drivers in particular, so I'll go back to circa 2020, uh, when we did have some ERA changes with rest and meal breaks. Uh, from there, we actually initiated an interest-based problem solving with the sector ongoing. And so in Auckland in 2021 with the CTU and unions and operators, we sort of got together and looked at what those minimum terms and conditions were for bus drivers and jointly worked together to get a baseline for improvement. That's what enabled the funding to come in and lift up drivers' wages last year. And so there is still working groups ongoing to get to some of those other things that we need to look at as an industry, uh, such as obviously the initial part was lifting the base wage, but there's other things that we all agree to that we need to do, uh, including how we deal with split shifts, et cetera. So, I mean, it does go to the job attractiveness and, you know, particularly uh, last year, the decline in terms of people leaving the industry when there's higher wage rates, there's better working con conditions, particularly around split shifts, uh, the socio-environment, uh, which is obviously always a challenge with public transport. It is an open network, and they're not necessarily public transport problems. These are community problems, and we need better community-driven solutions to, to help eradicate that and lift up the profile of the bus driver. I mean, ultimately, uh, the fulcrum of the industry, and, and in terms of that, we do need to raise their profile as being an important member of the community. Um, they take our children. Uh, they deliver people to businesses. And so we need to talk more about that. Thank you. Thank you. Can I just clarify then, because we keep saying we, mm -hmm. and we is all of us, right? Mm -hmm. And it's AT. But yep. when is we the bus operator? And when are we <laughs> uh, in a situation to enforce contracts and penalties? Um, we on the bus operator when they're not keeping their staff safe or they're not delivering the reliability and the punctuality that we need as a city? There, there is reliability and punctuality in terms of how that is bedded into the contract. Uh, so that is there. Uh, there is other options within our contracts too, such as a cure you know, cure plan uh, when things aren't going to right or there's been obviously a steady decline in performance or these other issues with that. So there are levers within our contracts uh, that the teams use in order to be able to lift performance. So you've told us about Howick and Easton. They're obviously not getting any levers used on them. Fantastic, good on them. Mm. Are there other companies that are having levers that are being pulled? Are there other levers, did you say? No, no, are there companies, bus companies, yep. that we are pulling these contractual levers with? Yes, absolutely, there is. And can you share the names of those companies? Because I think there's some no. frustration that, no. that it's quite patchy, the performance across the region. Yeah. And when we see a 96% mm. figure, as Councillor Bartley mm -hmm. po pointed mm -hmm. out, Power and Eastern are at 100%, but NZ Bus is at you know 60%. We need to know that kind of level of detail, I think. I'll leave yeah. it there, Chief. I will say, say this, there, there is a, in terms of bus driver as a vocation, you are always going to have different challenges in different regions in terms of that. That's largely due to obviously the cost of living in certain areas and the tractability of getting workforces to locations. So in terms of that, it is an ongoing thing that both our teams and our operators are working on, and yes, some are doing better than others. But in terms of the contractual side of it, no, we, we won't be talking about that in detail today. Right, thank you, uh, Councillor Ferry. So uh, I think, uh, Chair Donnelly, you wanted to make Mr. a comment? Mr Chair, if I could just come back to the um, growing public transport question before. I, uh, Mark mentioned that we're starting work with the Regional Public Transport Plan, which will be workshop with this committee. It is time to think outside the box a bit with us because um, public transport system has been largely designed around people going to CBD's office work, that kind of thing. That's dropped off. Um, the other markets don't, don't always travel to the same place to work and we need to be more flexible about how we deal with those. Um, and I think we're 
the opportunity here is to think about who what our future partners might be. And they're more likely to be major employers who are not on the CBD, but who might want to do something to help their staff get to work by public transport. Recent tax changes removed fringe benefit tax from public for companies supporting public transport fares. I mean that that will that kind of thing will make a difference, and and we could perhaps even try and get government to push it further and actually make it tax deductible. All of a sudden, every employer in Auckland becomes a partner in terms of growing um, public transport. Companies are going to have to report against their commuter emission footprint. They can do that by encouraging their staff to get onto public transport. We're not talking to employers around the city yet around how, how, how do you bring those things to bear. So, um, and we've, we're experimenting with things like AT Local, which actually is a more on demand. So rather than trundling big buses with empty seats, you actually have a different mechanism of, of getting people onto, you know, onto the rapid transit routes. As I mentioned to Councillor Sayers' question, unfortunately all that stuff takes operational funding, not capital funding, and that's probably what the, with the bind we're in. But I really encourage um, this committee, in, in your workshops around the public transport plan, that we bring other, don't think in terms of what we do all the time, but what could other organisations or other parts of the business sector or employment sector do to actually bring this sort of thing forward? Because I think there's a few breakthroughs in there to be... To, to, to experiment with that we're not currently doing. Yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Wayne, for those uh, concluding comments, certainly in places like Vienna with the Vienna Pass, which is incredibly successful. It's employers that often provide that to their, to their workforce, so, so essentially they're paying for all their, their transportation needs. So, yeah, I think the people well, in this committee will be with up the to that. with the national ticketing solution approach that's coming along, that's exactly the kind of versatility that we should be pushing for out of that, out of that program. Because it, you know, that that would make the financial transactions between employer, the employee, and the bus system, and the and, and the and the and the and the, and the um, government funding system much easier to do. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, could I have someone to please to, to move that we receive the, the update and report and relevant actions and plans to address issues? Uh, okay, moved by Councillor Simpson, second by Councillor Fletcher. Um, I don't think there's been a lot of really good questions. I don't think there's any need for anyone to, to talk to this. All those in favour? Aye. Aye. Against? Carried. Um, we, we 